everyone and welcome back to the second season of Life Science Learning. I'm Shilan, a representative from the Academic and Research Bureau of Malaysian Dental Student Association, MDSA. For your information, Bite Science Learning is a series of academic videos that cover clinical topics and also common questions that students and dentists will encounter. Today, on this season, we will be talking about restability and adhesives. It is our great privilege to have Dr. Vinnie Rajit here with us today. She is a lecturer from the Prosthodontics and Advanced Conservative Dentistry Department of Ames University. She is also a member of the Malaysian Association of Prosthodontics and the Indian Prosthodontics Society. Her area of expertise is oral and maxillofacial prosthodontics and general restorative dentistry. Thank you, Doctor, for your presence here today. We truly appreciate your willingness to share your scholarly knowledge with us. She will also be performing a live demonstration of a piano presentation. So be sure to stay tuned to that exciting part. So, Doctor, can you tell us more about direct and indirect restoration? Uh, sure, Ms. Shilin. Uh, before that, uh, I thank Ms. Shilin and her group for inviting me on this uh, bite-sized learning session. Uh, it's a great privilege for me. So, coming back to the question, um, yes, Ms. Shilin, you were asking on direct and indirect restorations, right? So, uh, direct restorations is any restoration that you directly uh, do inside the oral cavity and onto the tooth structure. So, uh, if you see your GB Black's classification 1 to 6, uh, you can do the restoration on direct restoration on any of these cases. Okay. So, for, for going to indirect restorations, usually what we fabricate in the lab. Mm. which you cannot directly do on inside the oral cavity or do on the tooth directly. You fabricate it in the lab and then you use some cementing medium to put it inside the tooth. Then that is called as an indirect restoration. So in that case, how do we decide when to do a direct and an indirect restoration? As I told you, any carious lesion which is of minimal size, we can obviously do direct restoration. Mm. But anything which requires more retention or retentive features, as well as you cannot be, uh, you won't be able to do inside the patient's mouth due to various factors like uh, over salivation or uh, resulting in difficulty in bonding. In such cases, it's better you go for indirect restorations. For example, if I tell your amalgam restorations, your direct composite restorations, all those are direct restorations which we do directly inside the patient's mouth. Mm -hmm. And when we go to on lace, in lace, or crown and bridges, those are, uh, or your laminate veneers, those are uh, type of indirect veneer, indirect restorations. Okay. Since we have a better understanding of what is indirect and direct restoration, um, we shall move on to crown preparation. Can you briefly explain what a crown preparation would look like for a porcelain fused metal crown? So to your knowledge, I will tell you there are various types of tooth preparation based on your material of choice. Okay, We have full metal restorations and you have all ceramic restorations and whereas as you told you have porcelain fused to metal restorations. The overall preparation pattern or sequence of preparation remains the same. But the um, you know measurement, how much we have to reduce, that varies for each restoration. So in, in total, if I tell for all ceramic restoration, you may have to do more amount of preparation. Whereas for a full metal crown, you need very minimal preparation. And for a porcelain fused to metal crown, you have to do something in between this. So if I go in detail, you have to do about 1.5 mm of reduction legally and about uh, 0.7 to point, nearing 0.8 to 1 mm on the palatal surface mm -hmm. and on the incisor edge you may have to reduce 2 mm. This is what you need for a porcelain fused to metal crown. Okay, I understand that during crown preparation we need to shape the gingiva for a better fit and since we need to make a custom crown, we need to get the best impression for the prepared tooth. So, can you share with us how do we manage the soft tissue during crown preparation? During crown preparation, um, the challenge we face is, uh, first thing is the fluid, the saliva. So, first thing what we have to think about is how to control the fluid. So, we have various methods for controlling, like uh, rubber dam application, okay. Apart from that, you can use sweet doctors or your high and low volume suctions. So, these things will help you in fluid 
uh, control. So once you go to, uh, once you finish with your preparation and start with your impression procedures, you have to manage the soft tissue more because we have finish lines. So for every preparation, we have to expose the finish line. Why? Because then only you will have a proper marginal integrity. So if your impression cannot record the finish line properly, that is which is very close to your soft tissue, you are not going to get a marginally adaptive prosthesis, which can result in failure future. So for uh, um, soft tissue management, we have various methods. So our main aim is, is to displace the gingiva near the finish line so that the finish line is exposed. Fine. So how you do that is, there are various methods again, classification is there, we have mechanical methods, mm -hmm. we have chemical mechanical methods and we have surgical methods as well as uh, we have total um, retraction cords we use. So retraction cords can be mechanical as well as chemical which we commonly use in our clinic. There are various sizes of retraction cords available mm -hmm. and uh, it can be impregnated, impregnated in um, like epinephrine or it can be free of epinephrine to control the bleeding. Okay. And then we have mechanical methods. Nowadays, uh, we have magic foam cords. Okay, they are uh, polyvinyl siloxane. Basically, it is uh, applied onto the surface, and then you have some compression cap type of things, which uh, actually displaces the gingiva. Mm -hmm. Then we have chemical methods. Uh, to give an example, we have something like called as expasil, mm -hmm. which has aluminium chloride. And surgical techniques are also there, which is uh, not very commonly used unless it is of high importance, especially in case of gingival enlargement or you cannot retract the gingiva, you may go for something called as uh, gingitage mm -hmm. or uh, then you can go for electrocautery. Mm -hmm. So these are the few surgical techniques which uh, you don't commonly employ but can be used. I understand that in a lot of cases there will be periodontal disease in the tooth that is planned for a crown procedure. Hence, there might be gingival recession or alveolar bone loss. So, does the length of the root affect the crown preparation? And what is the importance of a proper crown root ratio? Your entire treatment plan is based on your abutment selection. If mm -hmm. your abutment is strong enough, you can go for a fixed uh, prosthesis. Mm -hmm. So, if your abutment has minimum 2 is to 3 ratio, that means 2 parts of crown and 3 parts of root. That is the optimum or the best thing which you can choose as an abutment. At least, there should be 1 is to 2. Mm -hmm. That means 1 portion of crown and 2 portion of root. Mm -hmm. But some cases, there might be periodontal diseases. So, in the, that case, if your alveolar bone has uh, resolved, I mean, receded, so in that case, we can go for at least 1 is to 1 ratio of crown to root is there. Mm -hmm. We can opt for uh, crown. So, I hope you understood. Yes, thank you, doctor. Now, let's head on to the Whoa. most exciting part of this video, where Dr. Vinny will carry out a live demonstration of crown cementation. So, let's go. This is Dr. Vinny and she will be performing a live demonstration of a crown cementation. And this is Mazia, uh, operator today. And let's start. And now, we are removing the temporary crown, which was cemented using Tem Bond. That is a temporary cement. And then, uh, usually there are many uh, crown removal systems. You can use any small instrument at the margin and remove it. So once the temporary crown is removed, we go for cleaning of uh, that particular tooth. So you can use a scaler for cleaning to remove the debris uh, of cement as well as food debris. Uh, since it is non-vital, we have used the ultrasonic scaler. We are going to check the fit of the crown. We check whether it is adapting to the margin. This patient is having a removable partial denture. We are trying the crown inside with the removable partial denture and we notice that the crown is not reaching until the margin. To know the exact location of the uh, interference, we are just putting an articulated paper in between the removable partial denture and the crown. The removable partial denture is causing some interference. So we are going to trim the removable partial denture and so once the trimming is done, we could note that the uh, crown is going until the margin even with the removable partial denture inside. So once the crown is completely in, we are going to check the occlusion now. We have to just place the articulating paper where, uh, and ask the patient to buy a centric occlusion position and then also do the eccentric movements. There are dark spots which have come on the crown. That means there is some high point in relation to the crown. So we have to trim that area. And once that is done, we can check back again. So for checking the centric occlusion, you can use the red color side and then you ask the patient to bite. After that, you change it to the blue color side and ask the patient to move left, right and protrusion. 
So in that sequence, we are we note where the markings have come. That is the patient's original occlusion. So now next we have to put the crown or the bridge, whatever you have, the multi-unit bridge. You can put it inside the patient's mouth and do the sequence again. So you have to do the centric occlusion by putting the red side down, and we can put the blue. Uh, once it is recorded, we can put the blue side down and ask the patient to do the eccentric movements. So we are going to compare with and without the crown whether the markings are same or not. If the markings are not the same, that means you have high point. So when we observe the crown, uh, the prosthesis, that is a single jacket crown, we could see that there are red and blue points which is related to the high points on the crown and using that again we are trimming those points. So once those points are trimmed completely, it is put back into patient's mouth, again confirmed with articulating paper for the occlusion. So once the occlusion is completed and patient is satisfied as well as you are satisfied with the occlusion, you stop there and you have to do the crown polishing of the crown. So this you can see here a caliper is being used to check the thickness because for PFM usually we keep the thickness of metal 0.4 to 0.7 and remaining will be your ceramic thickness. Ultimately we have 1.5 to 2 mm of thickness. So based on that we can trim whatever is required. So based on the measurement only you have to trim further. We go for final glazing of the crown, polishing and then glazing of the crown takes about 30 minutes for finishing the glazing. For this patient, we have to check again whether it is interfering with the RPD and you can see the margins are well adapted. So yes, so we are finally ready for the cementation. So you can see here we have uh, muting resins, uh, GICs uh, which we are not going to use in this case and we have adhesive resin cements. Um, of various types, but here we are going to use self adhesive resin cement. So, in order to enhance the bond, we have to apply one drop of this universal primer inside your cork. Okay? Then, we just put one click of resin cement onto the mixing pad and mix it. Then, you can load it inside the coping. So, inside the crown, on the tissue surface of the crown, we can load the cement. So, once it is loaded into the crown, you can immediately place it into the patient's mouth. You have to do proper isolation. That means you have to either use a split dam technique or you can use um, cotton rolls to block uh, or, or to prevent saliva. And always make sure whenever the crown with the cement is inside, you have to hold the crown. Otherwise, there are high chances it can rebound. Uh, rebound. And then remove the excess with gauze uh, or uh, explorer tip. You can use explorative also, but it's better to use gauze. Also make sure floss can easily pass in between the tooth. So since this cement can cure, it's dual cure, inside the metal undergo self-curing. The light will not pass through the metal for light curing. Whereas on the borders, you can just apply the light cure uh, all over the borders. So we are putting the removable partial tension, asking the patient to bite again. And again, we check for the occlusion and make sure that the occlusion has not changed after cementation also. The margin of the crown adapts well to the margin of the tooth preparation. So this is the final stage and once you are happy with the occlusion and the fit, you can give post uh, insertion instructions to the patient. Here we have done with the crown cementation and you can see a happy patient talking to her uh, operator. Thank you, doctor, for sharing your expertise with us. I'm sure that every single one of us here has benefited from your sharing. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, especially to you and MBSA. Uh, so, hope you all have learned. Uh, it will be great time for me too, explaining things. So, that's it. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.